So good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining this uh, panel program on ripple effects, uh, where we will discuss how micro moments can define us and others. I'm Anna Kropitsky, uh, Vice President for Human Resources at HCCC. Um, I would first like to thank the collaborators um, who make this and other similar programs a reality. Uh, thank you to Natalia vasquez Botkin, Kyle Woolley, and Amala Ogborn. Um, the Office of Human Resources continues to work closely with the Academic Support Center and others, including the President's Advisory Council on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And so on this note, I will ask uh, Yoris Pujols, the co-chair of PAC Day, to say a few words on our work and uh, collaborations. Yoris? Hi, good morning, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, well, well, first of all, I want to thank you for your leadership and your continuous collaboration with PAC Day. And of course, as you mentioned, I also want to take all the members and all the, the team members that are working behind the scenes to make this event so special and so meaningful. And ripple effect, I'm sure, will be just as amazing. And of course, I want to thank the panelists for lending their time and for sharing a little bit of themselves to everyone else. These programs will help us get to know members of that community a little better, to understand and accept that our backgrounds might be different, but that our experiences, circumstances, and aspirations provide us a common ground that should help us embrace and celebrate our diversity. Uh, thanks again. I'm happy to be here, and I'm just looking forward to another amazing uh, program. Thank you, Yoris. No pressure. <laughs> um, so what is uh, a ripple effect? Um, one common definition is a continuing and spreading result of an event or action. So to illustrate this, um, I will quickly share um, my story, but then we'll, uh, we'll start with each of our panelists um, and I will ask them to introduce themselves uh, in the way that they want to be introduced. Uh, and then they'll share um, their impact story, whether it's of themselves or of someone else. So um, I know this may be very hard to, for some of you to believe, but there was a time when I was a very shy and quiet human. Um, and having to raise my hand in class was uh, close to torture for me. So uh, the moment that I still remember to this day was when I was a sophomore in high school. This was my first semester in a school as a transfer student, so I didn't know anyone yet. Uh, this was also one of my first real um, American classes um, after my English proficiency was finally good enough to go above ESL. So this was a challenging time for me to say the least. Um, so that day it was American government class and we were discussing constitutional case that was before the Supreme Court where a public school wanted um, everyone to say a non-religious prayer and one student refused um, because of their religious beliefs. So um, after discussing some of the details of the case, the teacher asked the students to raise their hand if they thought the school was right to make this rule. And the majority of the students in my class raised their hand. The teacher then asked the students to raise their hand if they thought that the student was right to refuse to say the prayer. And uh, to my dire embarrassment, I was the only one that raised my hand. So you may imagine as a 14 year old newbie, I just wanted to crawl in a corner and become invisible since I was obviously wrong and the rest of the class was right. Um, but then the teacher announced that the Supreme Court taking the case actually agreed with me. And I remember the teaching saying the words and they agreed with Anna <laughs> and that the official prayer, um, uh, even if it was non-religious to begin the school day, was an unconstitutional violation. So something happened to me when the teacher made that announcement. Everyone was now looking at me and perhaps um, seeing me for the first time because I was the only one that was right. I've never forgotten that feeling and have carried it with me. Um, that sense of right, of uh, being right, the confidence that I may disagree with others, but nevertheless be right, uh, has been very empowering in many situations, personally and professionally. And so um, that has contributed greatly to my continuous engagement in advocacy and social justice. And so that one moment of a realization for me has continued throughout my life. Um, so now, 
How about our panelists? I will start with um, Omar Williams. And I'm starting with Omar since this particular topic and theme came to life because of him. Um, so I will now let Omar introduce himself and share his impact story. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, Anna, thank you. Uh, committee, thank you for putting this all together. Um, I personally appreciate it, and I'm, I'm sure everybody who's going to be listening in will definitely benefit from it in some sort of way. Um, so for those who don't know me, my name is Omar Williams. I work with ITS as the manager of web and portal services. So long story short, I'm the person who deals with the website stuff and the portal stuff. So in the future, if you have any issues, nine times out of 10, I'm the first person that you're going to be contacting. Um, I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York, um, and I um, hold New York dear to me. And I just right off the back, I have to say I love Hudson. I love being at Hudson. I love working with everybody here. Everybody I have come into contact with is, has been amazing, and I don't see any reason to think it would be different moving forward. Um, my story is I can actually pinpoint three key points. So one, believe it or not, is a picture, one is a movie, and one is a conversation. So when I was uh, maybe in the third or fourth grade, my mom um, drew a picture just to entertain me and my, my siblings. She drew a picture of a Ninja Turtle. And this sounds simple, super basic, but in that moment, I realized that I wanted to do something in art. Now, by no means was she a uh, Picasso, but it was something that stuck with me to this day. And in the, in the, in the school that I was going to, it was a combination of that and the, the motto that I carry to this day. And some of you may have even heard me say it is excellence without excuses. So that, that picture, which is drilled into my head, helped me establish that I wanted to work in the arts. What kind of fine tuned that was the movie part, which in 1992, Eddie Murphy came out with a movie called Boomerang. And that was about a man of color working in the world of advertising. And that was the first time I had seen something like that. I was like, okay, he works in art, he does business, and that's awesome. I want to do that. Because prior to me saying I want to do art, people were like, well, are you going to draw pictures on 42nd Street? Are you going to make money that way? And it kind of downed my spirits, but then I saw that movie. And that dictated me taking art seriously, um, doing different types of art, charcoal, still life, so on and so forth. And it, it dictated the high school that I selected, the, the course, which I studied commercial art, it, um, my choice of college, which I went to New York City College of Technology under an advertising major, um, graduated with a bachelor's. And, I, and prior to that going to college, the conversation part was between me and my brother. And... That conversation was that he didn't see how we were going to get go to college. Now, by no means were we struggling financially, just at that age, he was a bit of a pessimist. Um, but I realized that he didn't see the path because we had never seen, even though we knew people, even had family members that went to college and so on and so forth, we didn't know anybody that, uh, uh, you know, aside from my father that I guess our pair group that seemed like they were on that track. So in that moment, I realized that I had to show my brother that it could be done. And from that, I, I, that's kind of guided how I operate through life. And that's kind of what, in essence, kind of sparked this kind of conversation because I realized that there's always going to be somebody watching you. Not that your life isn't your own, but that you are always in a position to inspire. Now, there's some people who would say that they don't, um, they're not doing what they're doing to be a role model or, the, or they're not looking to, to be anybody's idol. Not that you're looking to be anybody's idol, but you have to realize that once you are in the forefront, you are inspiration to somebody in a negative or the positive. So that, that picture, that movie, and that conversation has kind of guided my life and that model excellent without excuses. It's guided my life as far as not what I do or how I do it, but who I do it for. Because I, you never know from one moment to the next as you're living your day-to-day -day life, who you're going to inspire by what the work that you do, the way that you conduct yourself, the way that you treat others. These things have ripple effects. And I've been fortunate to come across people who I've interacted, young people in the past, who, who told me that, well, when I saw you doing this, it inspired me to do that. 
And I know sometimes when we're doing these things, we don't get to hear that. I When I started my career, I'm, I'm going to wrap it up because I'm sure I'm probably leaning into somebody's time. Uh, when I started my career as a senior graphic designer, I worked with a family-owned business that was sim similar to Edible Arrangements. And it was a family-based business, so they would have their kids come around. And I just did my job. I was friendly with the kids, and it was not, I thought nothing of it because they were like in their teens or whatever. And one of them reached out to me maybe two years ago and said, I saw you working in Photoshop, and you were making all these amazing things, and it inspired me to go into that. It inspired me to, to go into the, the graphics, and even though it didn't pan out for me, your, your enthusiasm for it made me follow my true passion, which was automotive. And he, he's like one of the best mechanics in Miami now. So those are those moments that I wasn't looking to inspire, but yet I did. So I, that's why I feel like it's important to kind of really keep that in mind as we're walking through life that this is what we do. Thank you. Thank you, Omar. You see, you have a lot of applause there. Um, this is the time when I miss being with everyone in one room. This would be like a standing station almost. <laughs> uh, um, let me ask if uh, Jenny Bobea can um, can continue with her story. Absolutely. Hi, everyone. My name is Jenny Bobea. I'm the Associate Dean of English and ESL. And my defining moment uh, that I, I really remember, and I have a few, but the one that really sticks out to me the most is during college, my sophomore year. It was my spring semester of my sophomore year. And I, I had been just feeling very lost in, at, at Fordham. It was sort of like I, I didn't belong. I, I went to Fordham, which is a four-year private school in New York, and I felt very alone. I felt I, I was a commuter. I you know, didn't have a lot of friends. Most of the college is residential. I, I felt like I was having a really hard time reconciling my own background with kind of the college environment because my, uh, my parents were very conservative. They were very traditional. They were very strict. And I, I felt like there were a lot of things that I, I couldn't do. And, and that transferred into kind of what I wanted to do in college. I, I went in there undeclared. I went to Fordham undeclared for the first year and a half. And I felt like I had to choose a career that my parents approved of. And above all was traditional because my, my dad is an engineer. My mom is a psychologist and no one in my family ever did anything that wasn't either engineering, dentistry or med school. That's it. That Those were the three things we were allowed to do. And and I didn't find myself in any of that. You know, I, one, I felt really lost. I felt very alone. And I felt like that's just, it wasn't, the only thing I knew that I was good at was reading books and being pretty much a bookworm. I liked school. That was the only way I could define myself. And one day, um, you know, I had an advisor appointment with uh, the assistant dean uh, at the time of um, the division. I don't recall what, what it was exactly, but uh, I know that I had met with him once and that day, I really didn't want to go in because I was feeling very lost. I was in an education program for K through 12, which I was doing well in, but it didn't really feel like it was what I wanted to do. And I remember I almost didn't go to that advisor appointment because I, I felt depressed. I felt like I didn't have anything to, to show for what I was doing at Fordham. And the only reason I really went was because I remember having been in that office and looking at all of the books that he had in there and all of the different objects and being curious about them. You know, just being curious about the story behind all of the, the things that were in that office, because I like to sit in there, really. And and so I went and, and that day uh, I, I remember just expressing that, uh, yeah, I was in the education program, but I wasn't really happy. And and he asked me, you know, what I like to do. And, you know, said, I really like comp lit. I, I you know, which, what do you do with that? <laughs> what am I gonna do with an English major? There's, I mean, does anybody even here know what comp lit is, comparative literature? What do you do with that? It was, uh, it, it was, it was very difficult. And he, um, he essentially said, well, why not comp lit? Like, what, why not, if that's what you, you really like to do, if that, why not just double major and, and, and see where that goes? And, and I hadn't even thought of that. Honestly, like that hadn't crossed my mind to do something that I like to do because I like to do it and because it was going to make me happy at, at that moment. And 
And I feel like that, I don't think he knows that. It would be really interesting to contact him now and tell him where I am because I don't think he realizes, you know, what an impact that had on me because it changed sort of my perspective on not just college, but but life, you know, taking risks and, and doing some things that put you out of your comfort zone that may or may not necessarily jive with what you've grown up with, what you know, and it will lead you to so many different places and majoring, double majoring for me at that time, I didn't know what I was going to do. I, I got myself out of the education program. I never imagined going for a master's and now perhaps you know, doing my doctoral work. I never imagined that. And just taking that risk um, really opened so many doors for me, uh, both personally and, and professionally. So I feel that that was really a huge impact that uh, this advisor, this assistant dean had on me, Dean Atchity. I'll never forget his office and I'll never forget that conversation. Thank you, Jenny. More applause. I like announcing the applause, even though we can't hear the applause, but at least I can announce the applause. Um, so, uh, Kyle Woolley, would you mind uh, uh, continuing our storytelling? Absolutely. So, hi everyone, Kyle Woolley. I'm the head tutor for math, science, and business, and also the interim honors program coordinator. My story is basically how I ended up in higher education. Because, like Jenny, I originally was doing education for K to 12. Um, there was a couple changes before that, but I already always wanted to teach. I always wanted to be in education. Um, but come my senior year of undergrad, I started my student teaching. And to be completely honest, I absolutely hated it. It was not for me. It's just not for everybody. And I was speaking with my um, supervisor at the time, because at the college, I was also a tutor and supplemental instructor. And she's like, and she was also one of my education program teachers. Um, and she said to me, she's like, but you do excellent work with the college students. I could see how happy you are when you're tutoring, when you're working with the students in your SI sessions. So she's like, why don't you consider teaching for higher education instead of K to 12? And I was like, well, I didn't think of that. I don't know how does that work? Like, what do I have to do in order to do that? So she basically explained like, well, you're gonna need a master's degree and then you're gonna be able to start as an adjunct or look for a tenure track position at a community college. So I decided to take a semester off and I thought about that and I, kept working as a tutor and she kept just checking in on me all the time. So like, how's everything going? I see you're still really enjoying this and like education is what you're meant to do. So I decided to go back for my master's in math education. And then I ended up teaching here at Hudson County Community College as an adjunct also at NJCU in St. Peter's. So I was kind of all over the place with the, the adjuncting. And I started to realize that I was making an impact on a lot of students. I had one student that had taken my class um, for basic math, then taken my class for basic algebra, then taken my class for college algebra. And she came back to me when she was getting ready to graduate from Hudson and said, if it wasn't for you, I don't think I would have ever passed math. And it was extremely heartwarming and it was just so heartfelt that she did that. And she just came in, she like tracked me down one day. She's like, are you in your office today? I'm like, I'm in the adjunct office, you can come see me. So she tracks me down that day and just gives me a huge thank you. And actually, just recently, she had um, transferred to NJCU, and now she's actually applying for her master's program, and she asked me to write the letter of recommendation for her for her master's program. So long story short, like, even though I decided that K-12 to wasn't for me, I knew education was always for me. And this is where I ended up, and if it wasn't for my supervisor at the time suggesting that, I don't know where it would actually be. <laughs> Thank you, Kyle. And more applause. <laughs> um, next, um, I'll ask Allison Bach to share her impact story. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Ali. I teach English. And um, for my story, since the title of our panel is Ripple Effects, I wanted to tell a story that really shows the way that these moments can have a ripple on multiple people's lives. And in order to share my story, I need to go all the way back to the beginning of my career here at Hudson. So I was a young professor. And when you're a young professor, you have a teaching philosophy, but you're not really sure if it's right, if you're doing the right thing. And so one of the cores of my philosophy was that um, the most important skills that I could transmit to my students were the skills of reading and writing. And I believed that if 
um, if my students could master those skills, they could do anything. It didn't matter what career they were going into, that those would kind of propel them forward. And so the thing about that is that in order to um, read critically and write well, you need to do a lot of reading and writing. So on my syllabus, there were a lot of reading and writing assignments. Um, and this made perfect sense in an English class, but I also taught other subjects like cultures and values and film. And um, I was still asking my students to do a lot of reading and writing. Um, so another thing you need to know about being a professor is that you get um, student evaluations every semester. So for the students in the audience, you guys know every semester, you fill out these evaluations and you say what you enjoy about your classes and what you don't like so much. And my evaluations were um, generally positive, but there were there was a definite pattern of negative evaluations that said things along the lines of, um, is she crazy? We have other classes. This is way too much work. She thinks this is an English class. It's a cultures and values class. And so I would read these evaluations and I would say, you know, I feel like I'm doing the right thing, but maybe I'm not. And maybe I should be like, you know, assigning more tests. Is this the right thing to do? So I was kind of filled with doubt. At the same time that this was happening, a student enrolled in my section of cultures and values. And he was an older student. He had actually gone to NJCU like two decades ago and he dropped out. And he wound up having a very uh, successful career in management, but he kind of realized at a certain point in his life that that's not what he wanted to do that wasn't fulfilling for him. And he really wanted to become a teacher. So he came to Hudson and he was in my class. And I remember that after the first day of class, he came up to me and he was holding the syllabus in his hand and he said, Professor, I don't think this is the class for me because I'm looking at this and there is a lot of reading and writing on this syllabus and I dropped out of college because I hate reading and I hate writing. And I was like, look, um, I think you should stay in the class. I think it's going to be beneficial for you. You know, you like I, I have office hours every week. You can come. We can work together. I think this is really important. I explained about my philosophy. He didn't seem completely convinced, but he came back the next week and he stayed in the class. And he did exactly what I had said. He came to my office hours and he worked so hard and um, his papers were among the best I read that semester and he finished the class with an A. And then he went on with his life. Um, and it wasn't until uh, a few semesters later that I got an email from him. And um, I wanna just share a little bit of the email because it was so meaningful to me. He wrote, I think it's important to recognize those who have impacted our lives in positive ways. And I feel I owe you a huge thank you. I have been learning how to study for a while and I'm beginning to get into the rhythm of school. Your class, however, taught me how to read and comprehend. I know it may sound silly, but I didn't fully grasp the concept of it until I took your class. Yes, we read a lot and wrote and wrote and wrote some more. And thanks to that and your guidance, I feel more prepared to do any writing assignment. In a way, your guidance gave me the confidence that I needed to read and write and be creative. Although it was a lot of reading from beginning to end, you made it interesting and flawless. Everything basically connected perfectly from beginning to end. I truly enjoyed your course and appreciate the challenge. I am keeping busy and took two winter classes, biology with a B and sociology with an A. Between you and I, that B in biology was more satisfying than any A because I got the chance to help another student from academic suspension and almost failing bio and algebra to passing both classes with a C and C+. To me, that was rewarding, almost like what someone feels when they positively impact another person's life if you get my hint. And so I wanted to share this story because um, that email meant so much to me because in that moment I was like, oh, what I'm doing is right. Like this is helping people, right? And in the moment, my students might be not happy about the writing assignments, but they leave and they appreciate it. Um, but also it filled him with confidence and suddenly he saw that he could do these things that he didn't think he could do. And then he took that confidence and he turned it around and he helped another student to achieve what he needed to achieve. And then who even knows what that student did with their newfound confidence. Um, so I wanted to share this story to show the way that these, these moments can truly ripple through multiple people's lives. And more applause. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing, Ali. Um, and that is really the, the true nature of this, of this theme and topic. Um, so our final panelist is Kenny Favara. Kenny, would you mind continuing us off? Thank you very much, Anna. Can everybody hear me okay? I'm using my computer microphone. I'm not so sure if it's uh, 
working. But my name is Kenny Fabara. I am the Assistant Director of uh, the Writing Center and Retention Services. I've been with uh, the Academic Support Services Department for about seven, maybe eight years now. And I've been uh, working at Hudson since 2009. And I'm a former student of Hudson, but I'm not gonna tell you when I started because I'm, I'm gonna date myself a little too much there. But um, so I've been in tutoring for a while and I, I also teach at the college. Um, so my story really begins in, in many ways at 16, which was a pivotal stage in my life. At 16, I dropped out of high school um, for a number of reasons. And the reason why it's so impactful is because my parents were immigrants to this country. And I'm pretty sure, although I've never officially gotten the exact grade, they never made it through much of their own schooling back in their native countries. I think my father said he got to about sixth grade. Um, he's from Ecuador in South America. And a lot of times uh, kids have to drop out of school to work in order to help the family with bills, just food and survival. So, you know, they put um, an immense value on education, but being a first born generation, uh, being born, you know, first generation, I don't think I really understood the weight or the gravity of what an education, uh, you know, what, what it really means for one's life. So I learned the hard way when I dropped out of, dropped out of high school at 16 um, and working jobs, you know, whatever I can, whatever I could do. Uh, I worked pumping gas. I'm an excellent gas pumper, apparently. Um, I worked in factories, loading boxes. So I, I, I very much sold my physical labor, but not so much my intellectual. Um, and at some point in my life, I realized that I wasn't, I wasn't happy. Um, so I'm going to fast forward a little bit, um, dropped out at 16. I didn't return to school until 27. So there was this 11 year gap, but there's so much that happened within this 11 year gap, but that's like a whole different like panel altogether. But, um, so I, I came across this individual, a friend of a friend, somebody I, I did not know. And, um, you know, through conversations, he would ask just questions like, like anyone would. And I said, yeah, you know, I'm not, what, what are you doing right now? Well, I'm just working, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not in school, but I would like to go back to school. That's something that I found myself saying on a regular basis, just consistently saying, I want to go back to school because it was kind of like the thing to say, because it gave you some kind of, uh, well, it gave me a sense of like, if I say it enough, it'll happen. Um, but it didn't happen for a while. So this, this, this one guy's name is Mike. And he would ask me, so what, when, when are you going to go register? I said, well, soon, soon. And that became this routine response where I was just very much like, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to do that next week. And the next week became next month and so on and so forth. And then every time I saw this guy, he was just like, did you go to register for school? I'm like, oh, my God, like, to the point where I, I, I tried to avoid him, you know, like the plague. And uh, I said, no, but I'm going to when? Um, I'm probably going to go next week. This week, I'm really busy. I wasn't busy. I wasn't doing anything. But, um, you know, and he would kind of not hound me to the point of harassment, but he would make it a point to just, you know, be on me about it. And just somebody who's a stranger to me. I didn't know this person, uh, you know, on, on a per very personal level. Um, and then one day he calls me on, on the phone and he said, um, I'm outside of your house, of your apartment. And, and um, I'm going to take you to the school to register. And I said, this guy be, has got to be joking with me. So I pulled down the blinds very, very slowly. And I see his car parked out, out front. I said, oh, my God, how can I get out of this? I can jump out the back window. I can say I'm not home, but he knows I'm home. I told him I'm home already. Um, how do I get out of this? So I was just so anxiety ridden and panic ridden. And, and I, I knew I had no escape. So I had to go. <laughs> Uh, begrudgingly, I got into the, hey, thanks for taking me, you know. Um, so he drove me to Journal Square, 70 SIP. And it was almost as if I, I had just arrived at the country because he did all the talking. He said, this is my cousin. And he was Greek. And I'm like, well, we could be cousins, like very distant cousins. Um, and uh, he got the forms. He, he asked all the questions. I stood there like a mute. I was just like, it was a new experience for me. I hadn't been in the classroom or in, in the school environment, you know, since 16. And even when I was in high school, I wasn't really in high school, if you know what I mean. So I read, well, he registered technically. And, um, and then I, I started school and uh, th that was 27. And I went to the school and Yuri's will, will know this because Yuri's was actually one of my instructors um, back in the day. 
the school in West New York on Polk Street um, has, a, has a, anytime I find myself in West New York and I pass by Polk Street, I, you know, I have to salute the building and, and uh, the haunted building and uh, a lot of memories there. That's where I got my first start and that's where a new chapter in my life truly began. Because from that period to 16 to 27, um, so much happened. Uh, there's, there's a very, a lot of dark, uh, in, um, kind of unstable time, very unstable time emotionally and, and in other ways. And here comes this guy out of nowhere, essentially. And he literally takes me by the hand to the school and gets me started on the next venture. And then almost like that, I, I stopped seeing him. Like he, he just kind of didn't come around and we lost contact. I'm not even sure we really had much contact. Um, I, I haven't seen him since. And, and this is going back to 2005. Well, I revealed my, myself, but 2005. So it's really odd. I mean, I'm not going to get into this whole metaphysical kind of like he came out of nowhere and then he disappeared, um, you know, but, but uh, he had a huge impact. I think he was, I was kind of swimming in the dark looking for some kind of semblance of land. And I think he was like that, that beacon, that lighthouse that, that projected a, a, a sense of hope. And I think one of the things about ripple effects is that when you've experienced that, that generosity and, and the way that somebody puts themselves out there, not even in, in a, in a way that's uh, so magnanimous, it's just really, he just had an interest and he saw that perhaps I needed something. And I think that that's one of the things that I carry with me is looking beneath the surface and seeing beyond just the individual and, and you know, what the academic goals, um, but to see like, to show them, to, to illuminate something that perhaps they themselves don't see. And I think he saw that. I think he saw that I needed something. He, I think he saw that he felt, he sensed that I, I needed something desperately. And I really did. And uh, from going to school, I'm, just, I'm gonna throw in a very quick side one because it's, it's, it's imperative to the, to the story and I'll wrap it up. Is when I was in my early semesters, I took psychology at the college and my professor took a liking to me and he said, I think you have a lot of qualities for, to make it for a good tutor. And I, I've never tutored before in my life. And as a matter of fact, when I was in school, I had no idea of what I wanted to do, what I wanted to be. Uh, and this is at 27. I still didn't want to know. I still didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. Um, so he said, I think you should go. You become a tutor. And at the time I was working at FedEx, the graveyard shift at three o'clock in the morning until the last package was loaded onto the truck. So I was like, okay, I mean, it's not gonna hurt to try. And I went, I interviewed, I spoke with the person, applied, interviewed, got the job and I became a tutor. And I think that's the, the, the next moment where I realized where I wanted to be. And then um, working with students and then my own personal experiences, you know, I, I think pulling from the kind of that, that isolation or the darkness that I, I lived in for many years helped me better relate and connect with students who perhaps have experienced similar uh, situations. And, um, and basically I'm here today still at Hudson County Community College, you know, in 2020 because of the mission and that kind of idea where I can, I can share my experiences and hopefully be that same beacon of light that Mike was for me at, at, at a, I, at 27 or 26. So that's in a nutshell, my story. <laughs> and, and another standing ovation. Thank you so much for sharing, Kenny. Um, <clears throat> I really have to say, I, I, I think it's obvious, but I do wanna say that we have some really fantastic humans at HCCC. Uh, really have some wonderful, wonderful people with not only their own stories, but how they um, use those stories. I think maybe sometimes even unintentionally um, to continue the impact um, on our students and our colleagues, perhaps. Um, so I'm really, really thankful um, to be here. So. Um, We'll start with uh, some questions and answers, and I'll throw out a question or two, um, and then we're happy to take questions from the audience, from our students, perhaps. I know there's a class going on here, so <laughs> take advantage. Um, so um, for those of you who um, were the ones impacting someone else, what would you have done 
differently now that you know um, the impact. Who wants to take that one? I'll just call on you otherwise. <laughs> Um, so the question is, if we would do something differently, knowing what we did to impact them. Um, I'm not sure if I would have done every, anything differently. The only reason because the advice given was based on the, the life lived. So to I, in my mind, to do anything different would be to alter that outcome. Um, it, it may be in wanting to do better. If you alter it in some sort of way, it might change it where it's not as potent or as strong as it would have been. Okay. Else? Allison, you are the one that had the um, story of the impact on someone else. So, what would you have done? What do you think you would have done differently now that you know that that happened? I I can't say I would have done anything differently. I mean, I think it worked out really beautifully and. Um, I think, I don't know, uh, I, I, yeah, I, I think that um, when we kind of like put our heart in the right place, things are going to fall into place. And I feel like that's what I did. And that's what this student did. And I wouldn't have changed anything about it. OK, and now, uh, Kyle, you also had the story of impacting someone else. Yeah, I mean, I have to agree with both Ali and Omar. I don't think I would have really changed anything. I mean, it was basically the the attitude that I had and the the caring that I had for the students that was the the main impact which I do for all of my students so it's it's just it it happened out perfectly the way that it went and that she she went on to graduate and then went on to get her bachelor's and is now doing her master's program so I think it worked out perfect okay thank you and then um I'll throw out the, the other end of the question is for those of you who have been impacted by someone else, where do you think your life would have gone if that didn't happen? Um, I, I would say for me, I think I definitely would have tried to fit myself into the mold that my parents wanted me to be um, or, or that the expectations that they had for me. I think I would have forced myself to maybe say, maybe not in that education program because I, my heart wasn't into it, but I had such an array of, you know, different interests. You know, I think I would have tried to go a more traditional route. I don't think I would have uh, done my master's degree in Italy in a completely different country. I would not have <laughs> left the country. I don't, I don't think I would have done that. Um, I think if I hadn't had that conversation that day, I feel that I still, I would have continued to be kind of an undeclared major for quite a bit and still kept floundering because again i didn't feel like i had a, a, a support network um at the time and for, I, I didn't have and to this day i don't have you know a group of college friends you know because i, I didn't make those connections that, at, at that time um so for me i, I think i would have really not been in a great maybe, maybe a different place but i don't know that it would have been my my calling i really I, i'm so grateful for that day because it, it really made me um, not only take risks for myself, but I was also an example for my sister who uh, was following in my footsteps. So she went to four and four years later and was in the pre-med program. And she she is actually a very accomplished flautist. She's and she's doing her master's in performance. And it's completely different than you know what she would have done. And I think that she dropped out of that program um, because she was encouraged by seeing that I you know took the risk and kind of broke the mold in, in my family. And so, um, yeah, I really think that I would be in a different place. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. Uh, and uh, okay. Kenny, where do you think you would be right now? Certainly not here with, with all you lovely people. Um, I, I, I don't know. I think, you know, when, when I, when I, if and when I reflect on, on those years, because they, they, they were many years ago, that was a long time ago. Um, you know, you tried to imagine where your life would have gone. I think at some point, would I have gone up, come on my own to register? I really don't, I really can't say that I would have just because of where I was emotionally, psychologically in, in that state at that time. So I would like to think that I would have at some point, but it, it may have been another year, another two years. Maybe I'd be signing up right now. Who knows? So, um, 
if I didn't, if he, if Mike didn't, didn't uh, serve as that, as that beacon, um, the way the life I was living was not going in a positive path. It was not a good trajectory. Um, as I briefly alluded to, there was a lot of, a lot of depression, a lot of darkness, a lot of other things, um, instability in, uh, in various forms. And I think, uh, I don't know, maybe jail? No, I, I don't know. Uh, who knows? Who knows where I'd be? But um, I, I'm, I'm thankful that I landed where, where I did and that I did find that shore. Thanks, thanks to Mike. He brought me there and then he kind of let me go on my own to, to figure things out. Um, but I don't, I don't like to think about or live in regret because I can't change any decisions that I've made. I can only hypothesize, but then I don't, I try not to drift too much into that realm because then I, the fantasy starts becoming reality in your mind. So I just feel that I'm here today and I'm thankful that I'm here today. I'm thankful that my parents got to see me graduate three times at Hudson and then Rutgers at NYU. Hopefully a fourth, my PhD when, you know, another 20 years from now. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I think um, it's hard to say where I would have been, but I'm extremely appreciative for where I am though. Thank you, Kenny. And uh, as, as you and I have discussed in the past, I do see a PhD in your future. I really do. I don't, I think it's just a matter of time. Um, do you also see uh, who's paying for that? <laughs> well, <laughs> there, we do have options here. <laughs> so, um, so thank you, everyone. Um, I, I'm happy to open uh, the floor of questions to the audience, to our students. Um, please let us know. You can also type uh, your questions in the chat and we can pick them up. Oh, can I ask, a, should I type it or can I just say my question? You, you might as well say it. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, as uh, everyone was talking about their ripple effect experiences, I, I was, of course, thinking about my own experiences and um, I liked what Kenny said about not sort of lingering in regrets, but I do have these moments where I think, man, my life could have taken these other paths. And I wonder if I would have been just as happy or happier doing something different if I'd done something alternative. Um, for me, that's classics. I, I almost became a classicist and studied, you know, ancient works. And I think, I wonder what I'd be doing right now. So I, I would be curious if any of the panelists had those moments where you almost went on a different path that wouldn't necessarily have been bad, but just may have led you somewhere completely different and what those were. Um, yeah, so for me, I when I was younger, I had a plan A and a plan B. So the plan A was the art, um, which uh, was very much ingrained in me. That was because I was, like, um, it was exposed to me at such a young age that became a very large part of my identity for a very long time. But I always thought that what if it doesn't work out? So the other the alternative was journalism. Um, I I because I had an appreciation for art, I always thought that if I wasn't up to par art wise, that I could at least be expressive in in word. Um, but f for me, I was so passionate about the art the, the because then and now I feel like being an artist in any form is a gift because not everybody can do it. You know, if you take two journalists together, they're gonna see the same thing and express them in such a unique way that's unique to them. So because of that understanding, I went so hard with the art, with the expression and colors and, and styling and dynamics. But I always, in the back of my mind, I said, well, if this doesn't work, then I'm gonna fall back on this. But I learned early that if you wanna succeed, then you can't second guess. You have to push forward. You have to push past the insecurity. You have to push past the doubt. You have to push past the pain, the naysayers. You have to push past all of that because th you see a light at the end of that path that nobody else can see. And sometimes your your eyes are the only ones that matter, if, whether it's friends, family, parents, whoever. Sometimes you have to drill past through all that dirt to get to the diamond on the other side. So for me to answer that, um, actually in my story that I told, that was not my first change of major. I actually decided to do something completely different when I first applied to college for my bachelor's. And I kind of, that was senior year, years ago in high school. 
I got swept up in the whole like CSI thing. And I was like, I'm going to be a forensic scientist. Like, that's what I'm going to do. That just seems so cool. Like, I'm going to go for that. So I completely changed my major from like applying to schools for education to then applying for schools for forensic science and for the sciences. And I ended up in John Jay over in New York. I took probably the first two weeks of classes and I was like, this isn't for me. Why did I make this change? Why did I not stick with what I've always wanted to do? And it was just like a complete 180 back to where I was. So it was like, okay, we, we changed, now we're going back. And it was actually after that, like after those two weeks, I ended up just dropping out of school. Um, I made it actually into Hudson right at the very last day of like late registration for classes where I took a couple classes before then I transferred over to NGCU after that. And it was just kind of like this huge whirlwind of um, everything that happened within two weeks of starting school from day one being at John Jay to then two weeks later being at Hudson and then the following semester being at NJCU. Um, it was just, for me, it's everything always happens for a reason. And I always stick with that and believe that, that no matter what happens, it was meant to happen because it's gonna lead you where you're supposed to go. Thank you. Um, does anyone else want to um, answer that question? Otherwise we have a question in the chat that I can talk to. Oh, Eric, can you, can you just ask that question one more time, please? Sure. I was just curious about um, the kind of other, uh, the, the best word I can think of is regret, but I don't think it's regrets, but just uh, if, you know, a different decision had been made because you pursued a different interest or a different passion, right. right? Like what do you ever imagine? Like what your life would have been like in, in those times, what else you could have been or other directions? Um, but within the, within the 11 years that I was out of school, um, I, I was a musician. Well, once a musician, always a musician. But I was playing in, in, in various bands and doing some traveling across the United States and even, you know, was fortunate enough to go to Europe a few times. It was, you know, non-contractual, not like MTV type type music. It's very underground music like uh, um, punk rock, if anybody's familiar with that. So we, we, we got to play different shows and travel and sleep, sleep in vans and sleep under furniture. And it was a great experience. Um, <laughs> And, you know, I, it, because the type of music wasn't something that would, would get you a contract, a multi-million dollar contract, you buy a big mansion, we had to always work to pay our way. And, and that, was, that, was, that was fine with us because we loved what we did. And um, so, unlike Omar, who had a plan A and plan B, I said, plan, what, what's a plan? And I just kind of, I was living day to day and just trying to find my way every morning that I woke up. Um, perhaps not the best plan. But it was my plan. And uh, so I, I really don't know. I mean, you know, I thought about what if I had what, what if I hadn't dropped out at 16? What if I had just finished high school, gone to college? But then again, I wouldn't be here with all you lovely people. And also perhaps I wouldn't have gained, you know, who I am today, not to sound cliche, um, but it really was shaped by many of those terrible experiences that, 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 that I lived. Um, you know, it, it was a very dark period for, for many of those years um, without going into too much detail, but it really shaped how I view the world and how I interact and, and interface with people and, and my environments. So I, I wouldn't change it for the world. Um, I, you know, in those very moments, I would have given anything to change it. But now looking back, of course, in hindsight, uh, I needed I needed each and every one of those painful experiences to really um, mold me into the wonderful human being that I am, that I am today, <laughs> which many of you would agree, I'm sure. Thank you, Kenny. Yes, you are, in fact, a wonderful human being. Um, and all, all of us are. I think all of us really, um, I, I'm really amazed every day how much I learn about each and every one of you. Um, and these, um, as Dr. Friedman would call, nuggets. <laughs> Of, of stories. Um, it's it's really lovely to see. Um, I wanted to ask Natalie if you can help me with the chat questions. I know there, there were a couple of them posted. If, if you can um, let us know what they are. So we're going to address this in, um, in order of it coming into the chat box. So Kenny, the first question is addressed to you. Um, what 
was the most difficult thing trying to balance work or school? What did you do to balance it? Um, I think because I felt that I had so much, you know, so much life experience, but I, I really didn't have any school experience. I mean, people people read, have read The Outsider or The Outsiders, you know, in like fifth or sixth grade, and I, I didn't read it until like a few years back. So I, I was never an avid reader. I was never an avid writer. I wasn't in that kind of intellectual space. I mean, I was intellectual in my own mind, but not in that, I guess, formal, you know, formal academic sense. So for me, it was very much like a matter of life and death. I felt like I lost a lot of time um, in my life. So I, I, I desperately wanted to make up for it. And uh, I, I just devoured and absorbed everything I could. Anything that had a, had words on it, I, you know, became this new fascination for me. And I think it was that, that drive and motivation that uh, if you feel you're losing steam or you just you just you just want to go to sleep and you don't want to do that assignment. I just think about where, I, where I've been for the past, you know, 11 plus years. And I said I had enough time to not do anything, not to make it seem like I didn't do anything with my life for 11 years. Please let, let me not don't get that wrong. But um, I, I really that was my my driving my, my driving force. It was life and death. I, I had no choice. Either I do this and I do it 100 percent or I go back to where I was and I never was going to go back to where I was. So. Thank you, Kenny. And that uh, question was from Jesrela, Jesrela Gomez. Um, so our, our second question is from Crystal. What are some advice you guys have to time management? Now with COVID and online class, I feel like juggling life in school is so hard to do and it's easy to get behind. Uh, I feel like I want to answer this because <laughs> I, I can definitely empathize with you, Crystal. I have two very young children, <laughs> two and four. I am in a doctoral program, so I'm, I'm a student. It's an online program and, and I work a full time. So uh, it, it is. I think the first thing we need to do is acknowledge that this is tough. It's it's very difficult. And um, as far as time management is concerned, I, I find it very useful to categorize my tasks into what is a priority right now? What can I get done? And what do I need to plan out? For, so for example, if I have a long project that I need to work on for my doctoral program, I make sure I mark that on my calendar. If on the other hand, I have 10 student emails, 10 uh, issues that I have to get to, you know, in my inbox, I try to do those. Those are smaller, right? So those are things that I can manage and I can, I can do a little more quickly. So I try to get those done and then make sure that I com compartmentalize my time. So my time with my kids, there's the time for me to take care of my kids. There's the time for me to answer these um, or do these smaller tasks. And then there is the time for me to work on these larger projects. And I'm a calendar person. That That's one of the most useful things that I have, but also really compartmentalizing things for yourself and understanding what you can get down, done. What can I do today? You know, what's the small task? What are, what's the list of small things that I can get out of my way today? And then what are the things that are going to take me a little more time that need a little bit more planning? Thank you so much, Jenny. I myself, I'm a planner as well. Um, so we have a next question um, by my Berlin, Nancy St. Pierre. And it is, how often do you guys share your journey or ripple effects with your students? I, I, do you want to take, oh, sorry, can you go? go, ahead, Anna, go ahead. Can you go ahead and then I'll ask Allison to respond as well. Um, I do, I think, I don't, plan to, I think it just happens organically when, when I feel the conversation is leading in that direction. And oftentimes it does only because uh, I, I, I've taught intro to literature at the college, and but for primarily I've, I've, I've taught ESL level four. So many of the students come from the backgrounds that my parents came from, you know, uh, migrating to, to the United States, learning a new language, well, not a new language, but, but developing a second language as emerging bilinguals. And, um, you know, when you're standing in front of the classroom, I feel, it, depending culturally, sometimes they view you, they put you on a pedestal, and, and from the very first day of class, I, I make it a point to to level that playing field um, and explain to them that the only thing separating you from me is my experience and, and perhaps some credentials. Because if this were accounting or biology or even basic math, 
I'd be I'd be sitting where you are and you'd be teaching me. So it, it's very much, and it, it, I'd like to establish that that you know I, my experiences um, that I already have already have already mentioned, I share with them so they don't think that the person standing before them is some kind of authority figure in a sense, but more just kind of like a guide in a way. And 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 that I think comes from that idea of what Mike did. Like you know he guided me on a path, a much needed path. And so I, I share that with them just to let them know that. Um, Again, not to sound too cliche, but that you can really accomplish great things if you just have the right people in your life um, surrounded. You're surrounded by the right people who care. Um, and in this case, it was a total stranger. So you never know where that can come from. It can come from a friend, a family member, or someone on the bus, on the subway, or just walking down the street. You just have to be aware, keep your eyes open of your environment, and, and you'll, you'll find a lot of magic around you. So I do share that with my students. I was going to say something similar to what Kenny was saying. It does happen organically. I know for me, a lot of this comes out in advising appointments. So when um, when I advise students, and I don't know that there's a lot of room in classes to do it, but where you can, where it fits. You know, I think English classes and liberal arts classes give a lot more room for us to be able to share our experiences. So I think we're lucky in that sense. But um, I would say, my stories have come out in my advising appointments with students. And I wonder if that is a ripple effect of the fact that that impacted me. You know, I went to my advising appointment with the dean and that impacted me. So, um, you know, I, I think I'm very, on, on some level, I'm conscious of that. Yeah, and I would, I would just echo what um, Kenny and Jenny said about, um, when it comes up organically, which it does often, uh, I try to share it. Another thing that I think has been kind of cool and interesting about having online classes is that um, I'll use discussion boards, and that's kind of a place where I can share my stories in a way that um, maybe during, I feel like I, I can't take away from class time to talk about like myself or like my personal, you know, where I, my journey, but um, I can type a message on on a discussion board if I have a connection with a student, and I think that that can also create little ripples as well. Um, and I, I did want to give one piece of advice to Crystal also about time management, which is that this is my phone and it's like my best friend because I schedule appointments for myself. So like I'll make appointments like we're grading papers right now and my alarm will go off and it's like grading paper time. And so I try to set that time aside for myself. Um, and so maybe that's something that you can do too, is like literally schedule an appointment with yourself to do the things that you need to do. Um, but sometimes life's going to get in the way and you're going to have to cancel the appointment and you have to be kind to yourself and just know that you'll reschedule the appointment. That's really uh, wonderful advice that I have to follow myself. <laughs> um, I was going to say as a, as a person, I'm probably one of the few on the panel who's not a, a teacher or professor or so it's so um i typically don't have engagement with students but I, in the time that i've been at hudson i have come across students who were seeking advice on it stuff tech things and those are always interesting because the experience i can share with them is the time when i was freelancing and i can point them in a general direction um that maybe they weren't aware of before um certain interactions that they can you know just to kind of start you know reach out to the printers look at do research for pricing and that that comes from my own personal experience that because somebody did it for me so it's really a pay it forward kind of thing so even though i'm typically not dealing with students you just never know when you're going to come across and to kind of to, to connect to kenny's point when these things happen organically they have the stronger impact because i'm i'm never looking to talk with any student because i don't engage but you never know when somebody's going to come to you and say hey you know do you have a minute i have a question and before you know it that dialogue happens and then you impact that person thank you omar uh natalie do we have any other questions in the chat okay does anyone else want to ask anything or or respond i was going some of uh, a, a student has sent me a question um, just privately instead of typing it into the chat uh, that I'll ask, which is it's similar to the other question about balancing life, but the this, this students sort of push the question a little bit further to ask if you're at the point where it feels impossible to go forward, you're so overwhelmed that you feel like 
you just can't do it. Like, what, what do you do at that moment? Like, you just don't even know where to start. And it feels like maybe you're giving up th this, uh, this student in particular mentioned, um, feeling like she's going to have to give up on her dreams uh, because things are so overwhelming right now. Um, I, I would say for me, you know, because I've definitely been in those moments, uh, I, I, what has helped me is getting support. So reaching out for support. And luckily, I've had uh, support reach out to me first, because when you're in that spot, it is so difficult to actually go and reach out. It, it really is. And, and I think that we're lucky to be at HCCC because we have that we have a care team and it, it's so wraparound. It, it, it gives you so many wraparound supports that will help you get the pieces in your life in order so that you can tackle you know, the, the things that you want to do. And I feel I, I've had a cheerleader in my doctoral program. I got to tell you every month I'm like, I don't know what I was thinking. I have two toddlers. This is insane. Like uh, online learning. I mean, I cannot tell you the amount of things that go through my head on any given day. And, you know, one thing is, you know, asking for support, um, taking things day by day and what, and also what Ali mentioned earlier to be kind to yourself. I, I think I put it in the chat as well. Give yourself some grace, really just try to take one day at a time and see what you can what can be taken off your plate today that will make you feel less overwhelmed? And so feeling, you know, that you've gotten one thing accomplished and really taking that, taking that and running with it. You know, I got this done today and that is a motivator it has really helped me. But number one thing is a uh, support, really trying to access the right supports that can help you tackle the different things that are making you feel overwhelmed. And once those things start to um, get taken care of, you start to feel like you can do the next thing. Yeah, I'm going to jump in with that and echo what Jenny said, like having someone there to support or just kind of like check in on you. Actually, my person that checks in on me is currently on this call, Natalia. Always, uh, did you get this done yet? Did you check on this? Has, what's going on with this? And honestly, like, um, like Jenny mentioned and Ali mentioned, like grace and be kind to yourself. Sometimes you just have to break down every now and then. Like there are times where I just get overwhelmed, I break down and then I pick myself up afterward, check in with my people that I need to check in with that give me kind of the guidance and the suggestions or are just there when I just need to unload. Like sometimes there are just times you just need to get it all out and it can be overwhelming. It is overwhelming. I mean, I remember I actually started a doctoral program also like Jenny's in one um, last fall. And I was a little ridiculous when I started that program because I started with one class in that program. I was working full time nine to five and then I was also teaching four evening classes that semester at two different colleges. So it was very overwhelming. I was working Monday to Thursday from 9 a.m. to 10 o'clock at night, um, and then like trying to get everything done on the weekend for my classes or trying to get things in between. Um, so it's just good to always have someone to check in with, um, whether it's just a talk, whether it's someone that is um, kind of checking in on you, like, how's your homework going? Did you get this done? You know, this is due soon. Do you need any help? Anything like that. Um, so it's always good to have someone there and again, be kind to yourself, do it with grace, break down sometimes like it, it helps. Trust me. It really does help. <laughs> yeah, if I could just, I guess, add to what everyone has said. Um, in, in addition to seeking out supports and whatnot, um, and breaking, breaking down as Kyle says, I was just letting it out, you know, keeping it bottled inside, uh, eventually it'll just explode like a time bomb. So it's always good to, to vent or to, to speak with somebody who will lend you a kind ear. Um, but also knowing yourself and, and understanding the, 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 thing, the factors that trigger you or the factors that impact you in, in certain ways. And I think it really is about looking in that mirror and understanding you as a person. Oftentimes we get so bogged down with work and school and family life and every other responsibility on our plate that it's really hard to take time for yourself to really just kind of introspect and reflect on who you are and what makes you feel the way that you feel. And I think you have to kind of dive deep into, into the, sometimes the, 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 more, the darker crevices of the mind um, to really just get a, a better understanding of who you are. I think if you look at both the trees and the forest, you get a, a, a complete panoramic view of, of your existence. And it, it, in a way, what I'm saying is, is for the most part kind of existential, but that's the way I, I that's the framework that I use for just about everything. You know, I, I've been in that situation. Many of us have been in that situation as students and, and, and just as people in general, 
And I think the weight of all that pressure on your shoulders, you start to crumble and you start to collapse and your knees get weak and you feel like you just can't, you know, take that next step. That's when you really have to do that deep diving introspection to, to figure out, you know, what you're made of in a way um, that you can forge ahead and you really can, uh, irrespective of whether you have external supports. I think a, a lot of it starts from inside. A lot of it is internal. Our, our greatest enemy or my greatest enemy has always been myself that internal conflict of what, what can I do? What can I achieve? And that kind of conversation you have with yourself about, you know, you can't do this. Yeah, you can do this. Motivation, demotivation, it's a constant battle. And that's a battle that'll last throughout one's lifetime. But I think if you understand how to navigate that battlefield, you'll come out, you'll come out on the other side as the victor because you, you clearly understand the mechanisms of you, what makes you who you are and what you can, what you can achieve. You just have to really believe in yourself. That's my third cliche today. Believe in yourself. You can accomplish anything. But in a, those cliches are there for a reason because they, they, they have merit. Um, you really, you have the drive, you have the motivation, the determination, and the passion to do something. You just do it. And don't let anybody or anything stop you. That's it. If anybody tries to stop you, you call me. I'll take care of them. <laughs> Thank you, Kenny. I just wanted to point out for those of you who are listening, uh, we do have some great resources in the chat. Um, we have uh, Doreen Pontius here, our um, uh, director of our counseling center. Uh, we have practically the whole academic support uh, center team <laughs> uh, to help you with tutoring. And um, um, Professor Adamson also noted very importantly that um, your professor may be the first person you may just need to to say, hey, I'm I'm having trouble. Um, I need some help, and they can either help you if it's something that you know within the class uh, um, uh, context, um, or if it's outside of the class context, they can certainly uh, point you to the resources uh, that we do have at the college. There there are many many resources, and and as you can see, we have many compassionate um, and passionate people who want to see. Um, all of our students succeed um, and believe in themselves. So, um, okay, any other comments? I know that um, we are uh, past the 11 hour. I know that uh, people are uh, starting to head out. Uh, we're definitely, I'll be here uh, for, for, for a few more, um, for at least um, I would say 15 more minutes. Uh, and so I'm happy to take any other questions or comments from the audience or from our students or from our panelists. Um, someone did send me another question. Um, this is from Marissa Lontok. She, this is for Jenny. She said, was there a pivotal moment or experience that made you decide to further your career despite the difficulties of balancing work and family life? <laughs> I think I don't know that there was a pivotal moment. I, I think that you know it's a combination of seeing of understanding you know where I wanted to be. You know what what I, I have always that I wanted to um, pursue another degree. You know I, I I have this hunger for for just getting more information, for understanding things better, and being able to do what I do better. So that always. It was always on my mind, you know, when I before applying to doctoral programs, and I think um, even a master's degree, degree program. I've always had other things going on, and it always it, it did take a while for me to think through. Uh, but then when I did make the decision, it had to be something, you know, from one day to the next. You know, I've thought about this enough, and there is a moment where you just have to not look back and not look at all the things you have and just take that dive. Um, in the same way that I took, you know, the risk of just majoring in comparative literature and English <laughs> without knowing where that was going to get me. So I think um, for me, just not looking back, not looking at the mess and really believing that things will work themselves out. And interestingly enough, just about everything has a solution. It really does. It, 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 I know a lot of times it seems like it doesn't. But, you know, uh, child care, for example, I, I will figure it out. You know, I, I, I will figure out somebody will give me a hand or, or I will find, you know, a resource and just really believing that. And I think that's the hardest part, because when you don't see it in front of you, you have to really just take a leap of faith 
you know, and, and believe that it's going to work out. And so that that for me was the moment, at least every time I, I've decided to take a leap, it's always been a leap of, you know, I can do this. And what's the worst that can happen? What is the worst that can happen? I certainly agree with you, Jenny. Um, I, I am very much in a similar situation with uh, two small kids and a PhD on my mind <laughs> and a full time job. Um, but I think that um, what's echoing here is um, taking one day at a time and I or um, some some people said one step at a time. It could be just the small things just like making your bed, just make your bed in the morning. And, you know, that's the small step that you have accomplished for the day. And that's a pretty big step because not everyone does that. Um, and then just, you know, go take a shower, go have your breakfast, just one step at a time. Um, I'm speaking from personal experience. <laughs> so um, I know this is definitely an overwhelming time for all of us uh, with the pandemic, with the um, COVID, with remote learning and working um, and both at the same time sometimes, sometimes being in two, three places at the same time. Um, and uh, so I appreciate so much everyone's stories because they are so real um, and they speak to our real life and how it impacts not just us from the academic or administrative perspective, but really um, how we we are our own students sometimes. Um, and so we do have a lot that we can relate uh, with our students. Um, so I want to offer any final um, comments or thoughts from our panelists um, or from anyone in the audience. And then we'll wrap it up. Um, I would say that in, in just in everybody's story, there is a lot going on as far as what we each are going through personally. And um, Jenny and Kyle and Kenny have spoken on this particular part. You have to allow yourself to be human. Do not let your 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 expectations or your your motivations or the the things that you're working towards become a weight around your neck. You know, don't don't. You have to allow yourself permission to sometimes make a lateral move, or maybe the pace that you're going at isn't the pace that you should be going at at that moment in time. You have to allow yourself permission to be human. You're not superhuman, you know? So just like Jenny said, every problem has a solution, but maybe that's not the time for that particular solution to take place. So you have to allow yourself a level of flexibility. Like your future is fluid. It's water, it's not ice. So you have to allow it to become what it's going to become. So allow yourself to be human and go the path that you're going to go. And sometimes it requires, again, flexibility without being redundant. And it's okay. It's okay if it's not the straight, the straight path. Sometimes it takes a curve. Sometimes there's a boulder you have to get around. But you're going to get there, and you have to believe that. If you don't believe it, who else is going to? You may have a, a support system, and that's awesome, but it's your walk. It's your story. You you dictate how that story goes. That's it. <laughs> I'm just going to finish answering one last question. I started answering it in the chat. Uh, someone asked if um, you know how. Let me just go back very quickly. Um, for Jenny, you mentioned that you had a conservative background in terms of your parents' ideas of education. So how did you convince them that your choice of career was a good choice? Um, the short answer is I don't think I did at the time. I, I really didn't. Um, my my mom was just so difficult about it. She just persistently asked me, "What are you going to do with that? What what is that? You know?" And uh, and they really didn't understand it. And and there was no real way that I could explain it to them. You know, mom, I want to be an academic, <laughs> or you know, I want. You know, it was it was a lot of really seeking out support from. At, at Fordham, really, you know, in my mentors, in those advisors, I, I I became very close to my my thesis advisor, who was a, a Latino uh, professor, really amazing and and very smart, and he worked with me very closely on my thesis, and and I remember just being motivated by these people, finding myself role models, finding models that uh, that looked like me, <laughs> that you know that 
that we're successful, you know, and so that motivated me because I didn't have that motivation for my parents. I, I, they were, they were very motivating in terms of yes, go to school, get an education, but their idea of what that looked like was very narrow, you know, and, and I think that over the years, you know, when they saw what I was able to accomplish and you know, their minds opened up a bit more, but you know, it's not to say that it wasn't, it wasn't, tough i think it was very tough at the beginning and i think still in my masters when i was doing my masters in italy people would ask me they would joke about it you know what is your major again like what are you majoring in and you know it just became something that i did for me you know that that i really felt motivated to do so that motivation came from it, it was internal thank you jenny i just wanted to point out that um um thinking about yourself in the context and what you bring to the table that's always important that will take you through your life at every point you know you're hired because of you you're hired because of what you bring to the table and your experience and uh even if you had a, an 11 year break sort of in the, in the education in between uh <laughs> so it's it's still um you are the one that um you know we would want to hire because of your experience uh, because of all the challenges that you went through. Um, so I want to offer um, um, the, the rest of our panelists to um, any concluding thoughts, um, Ali, Kyle, or Kenny. Well, I, I would just like to say that uh, another thing that I've noticed um, as a kind of theme running through everyone's story is that all of these panelists worked really, really hard. Like there was the micro moment, but there was a lot of hard work that preceded it and that followed it. And I'm also a hiker and I have been to many beautiful vistas, but the ones that I remember are not the ones where I just stepped out of my car and saw it. They're the ones that I had to trek, you know, for like two whole days to get there. Those are the ones that you remember. And so I think that um, even when it feels hard and it feels like we can't keep going, if we keep going, the reward will feel sweeter because we did that. Yeah, and just as I mentioned before, like things happen for a reason and people come into your life and cause this change to happen and give you this kind of influential thought and it leads you in the direction that you're supposed to go, even if you're not aware of it at the time. Everything is kind of like intertwined is the way I think about it. Yeah, and I guess if um, I had to say, I'll, I'll use like an analogy, I guess is um, about Sisyphus, who in Greek mythology was condemned to push a rock uphill for uh, perpetual eternity. Sounds like a lot of fun. But the idea is that every time he gets the rock closest to the top of the, of the peak, the gods push the rock back down. He has to walk down that, that, slow, that slow walk back down, the walk of shame, and then push the rock back up again. Um, but it was a matter of perspective. His per perspective changed so he didn't view it as a punishment right i'm not gonna go into the whole myth because it's a long myth but basically perspective you have your your situation whatever the case may be and depending how you look at that situation your perspective on it will dictate how you go about coping with it and coping is is a major part of of life how you cope with certain uh, certain situations whether it's schoolwork, family life and and work how do you deal with it? how do you navigate you know that 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 minefield sometimes um without without exploding you know inside and letting letting that break you down and you know i, I think it's, it's just a testament to your own fortitude like when you face those tough situations i hate to use cliches but they seem to come so naturally um what doesn't kill you only make you stronger it makes sense because you survived you made it through those tough moments at, and at those times when you said i can't do this anymore and then you actually do it you could look back and say i did it so what else what else you got for me life because there's nothing else you can do to me that's going to make me stop now and you have to adapt that perspective that mentality it's just a positive mental attitude that you carry with you everywhere you go and that's contagious just like negativity is contagious positivity is just as contagious if not more and then you can be that ripple effect of somebody else and just continue that domino and that chain reaction. And maybe the world will be a better place if we have more positive people doing positive things. So believe in, believe in the power of yourself, share that with others, and then they'll do the same. And we'll just all follow this path of paying it forward, hopefully. Thank you so much. Um, Iris, did you wanna say anything? 
um, as a concluding uh, coll collaborative thought? No, I just want to say that this was amazing. You are all guys incredible. This was uh, extremely lovely. And I, I just wanted to borrow some points and some of the things were me mentioned. Jenny talked about or said something along the lines of where you want to be at or what you want to be doing. And Omar uh, provided examples, not specifically about a conversation or interaction with a person, but about you know, a picture, a film, and, and, and abstract things, all other things that is not necessarily an interaction. And very briefly, I just wanted to say that one of the ones that I refer to is uh, is a phone call, uh, not necessarily a phone call, but a phone phone ringing. The the maybe like the eleventh or twelfth job that I had when I was like seventeen years old. That was my first uh, job uh, on the books. I worked at a at a fast food place. He went out of business. The cook that was my best friend. I just turned eighteen. He got me an interview at a at a building that I was going to be a doorman, you know, doorman, you open and you close doors and you say hello to people. I could have done that. But the issue that kind of scared me a little bit was the prospect of having to answer the phone. And I remember interviewing the, the supervisor. I did really well on the interview. And I remember my friend, you know, the phone ringing and him picking up and saying, good afternoon. Thank you for calling Buckingham Towers. How, my name is so-and-so. How may I help you? And I'm like, wow, I cannot. I cannot say all those words together. You know, I'm, I'm still learning English, trying to improve my ability to say that. And I'm not going to lie to you. At that moment, I felt and I wish that I didn't get the job because I felt that I could not do it. And I goes not, not just where I want to be, but when we ask ourselves, where do I belong? What, you know, my given, uh, my God given talents, how far could they let me go? And one of the things that spoke to me is like during that interaction at the lobby, someone else called and my friend, who was the cook at the other place, also picked up the, the phone. His accent was more, a little bit more pronounced th th than mine. It was a little heavier. And he did a fabulous job. And I'm like, oh, but if he could do it, maybe I could do it. And that's gonna be my challenge to all of you, like the students that are on the call, like, you know, and, and that talks to what, what Omar was talking about, uh, that, you know, your potentials are gonna take you as far as, as your aspirations, you know, shoot for the moon. And, you know, we'll do our best to support you in whatever way we can. But uh, you know, that's all that I had, and uh, you guys are amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. I will echo shooting for the moon. Uh, the sky is the limit, really. Uh, this is just the beginning for many of you. Um, as you see, many of the people here, uh, including myself, have a long um, um, uh, history with education, starting with with just ESL sometimes, uh, and uh, now uh, you know trying to uh, finish a social theory class in in, in their PhD program. So um, there's a lot of um, motivation and inspirational stories uh, here, and I appreciate everyone so much. Um, Ellie, um, Kenny, Kyle, Omar, and Jenny. I know Jenny had to hop off. Um, thank you again for my uh, collaborators, uh, Natalia, Kyle, and Amala, um, and uh, Yoris and Pack Day for all of your support and collaborations. Uh, this has been a truly wonderful, I feel really great going into the weekend despite these uh, rainy days. Um, and but perhaps poetically, the drops of rain are uh, settling in in the earth and and having their own ripple effect um, into our environment and into uh, our lives. So thank you all so much. Uh, we will be sending a, a short uh, assessment survey, so watch out for that in your email. And uh, we hope to see you uh, in further programming. Thank you so much and have a wonderful weekend.